All right. So first off, thank you guys for uh, joining today. I know it's kind of uncertain times right now, but um, anytime I get to talk football is always a pleasure for me. Um, so right here, my name is Scott Lawyer, um, former linebacker at the University of Washington from 2011 to 2015. Currently work at Atavis as a senior um, analyst and account manager for the FBS and pro level teams. And for me, my uh, perspective is kind of unique because I was one of the first players to actually go through the Atavis system at Washington. And so now it's really helped me kind of transition into my career. Um, obviously, I love being around the game of football and kind of sharing that perspective has really helped me in my last four or five years at Atavis. So, and again, very excited to uh, be speaking today. Go ahead and follow us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. We're always posting good content. So let's kind of jump into it. So I always like to start off with this, um, this call. I know, obviously, like I mentioned before, it's very uncertain times, very um, unpredictable, right? And it's not only a problem, but it's kind of a dilemma. Like how do we work on tackling year in and year out, all around the year, I mean. So um, for us, I think tackling is very, is some, somewhat of a, people kind of think it's a common transaction. Like everyone's just born knowing how to tackle. But for us, as a defender myself, you, it's really hard to work on tackling throughout the whole year, right? You know, as a quarterback, you're working on timing. You know, you're getting your seven on sevens, working with the receivers. Offensive lineman, you're working on your footwork, your hand placement. D lineman, working on your pass rush. You know, you're perfecting your craft. But tackling is one of those things that's really hard to get in all around the year. So what we do is take a really, you know, systematic approach. We're also having a data driven to provide insights to really empower not only the players but the coaches that are using our system. Okay. So we actually started working with Baylor uh, last year and they were one of the first to really adopt it fully and really go in all in it. And he's talking about basically he took 95% of what we taught him and really applied that, right? I think that's what the biggest thing is. Everything that we're talking about today, we might not see it eye to eye on the same thing, but if you can take one, two or three things that are gonna help your program tomorrow, I think that's gonna be highly beneficial uh, for you guys. Um, so here's some of the quick, um, some of the teams we've worked with. Um, Ohio State, um, this is after their championship, and Coach Fickle and Coach Ash came to Adams and said, hey, we want to take a holistic approach and or look back at our drills and our games and see are we really teaching it the way that's showing up on games. So we went in and we looked at all their film and really got back to the bones of what they were doing. Um, University of Washington, as I mentioned before, for myself personally, um, we came in, Coach Pearson came in, this is my junior year, he said, hey, seven and six is not going to cut it. We got to take the next step. And he felt that our tackling really needed to improve. So we come in, he brings out of us in. As a, as a former player, I can't even lie. I was like, what the, what, what is this? You know, like, I, so I was taught head across my whole life. And I'll tell you this, that the players are going to pick up on it much more than the coach, faster than the coaches are. Um, the players, it's going to be second nature. It's muscle memory, right? So that first year was a big jump. Um, Oklahoma, this past year, first year working with us, Big Ten, uh, Big 10, Big 12 football, right? So a lot of up-tempo gets you out in space, right? So being able to tackle and be confident is huge. Um, Michigan State, one of the early adopters. Now, I love this story because um, this is after their Rose Bowl year. They were 3-10. and 10. And then the first year working with us, they were able to flip the script to 10-3, and 3, win a bowl game. And what's really unique about that story is they had about, I think, 75% of their roster was underclassmen. So that was huge for us. Um, Baylor, Coach Rule big advocate for us, and that's a big jump for them. Uh, one of the most ag more, more aggressive defenses in uh, 2019. University of Cincinnati, I mean, the jump speaks for itself. That's, that's one of the top three uh, jumps in defensive efficiency um, in the FBS that year. Um, and then lastly, SCS, same story with Cornell, took a huge jump this last year on defense. Really confident and really um, did a great job of tackling. So one thing at Avis we always talk about is uh, the shoulder led tackling. So we actually took four clients. So Baylor, Texas Tech, OU and SMU from this first year working with us. And we took all their data and we looked at every time they're making shoulder contact versus arm, chest, head contact, whatever it may be, what was the numbers, right? So tackles made almost a 17% jump and performance. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but performance is basically every tackle is effective over all tackles attempted. And typically to be effective, we're looking for about uh, two to zero yards after contact given up, okay, roughly. Um, you have to average almost a 50% drop, right, when making shoulder contact. Explosive plays, now that's a little bit different for us. I know most coaches have a runs, you know, runs of 10 plus, passes of 20 plus. Um, but for us, it's any time a defender makes contact with the runner, and he gets an additional 10 yards after contact. That's what we call explosive play. So nine versus 92 when making shoulder contact. That's, we're not making shoulder, that's, that's huge, right? So. Very, very big story right there. 
I mean, obviously with the performance, we also look at the safety element. So those same four clients, we actually looked at a downward trend in head contact throughout the season last year. And that was, that was big too. So this is how we kind of evaluate the situations that our athletes are in. So we call this a tackle wheel. And this positive area, so you see this angle and profile. Now this is a little bit different, right? Now, like I said before, people are trying to get people in space more. So these are a little bit less uncommon to be in these profile angle tackles. But when they do happen, we feel at this point, the athlete has the ability to dominate contact and knock the runner backwards. So um, that's what we call a positive situation. And now when we get to the negative, it's not truly a negative situation. I was saying that the athlete did something wrong. We're just saying that he didn't have ability to generate power. Now the emphasis is all on controlling the runner down. So that's your lateral and chase tackle right there. And we actually find with a lot of our clients is the more aggressive and more downhill your defense is, you actually end up, you're going to end up in those lateral and chase situations by the nature of your defense. So we see that a lot with our top, our top programs. So here's a quick example of what we're looking for in a, uh, in a positive situation. So it's a practice clip. It's going to be a tag off tempo, but basically we're just looking for being able to maximize body on body contact, right? So here's a game clip from SMU right here. So watch the safety right here. It's going to be an example of a positive situation. So just watch how he closes space right here to really get into that situation. Shoulder, great shoulder contact, great, great leg drive to dominate contact. So we're looking for pretty textbook right there. Now, as I mentioned before, negative situations. Now we're not looking at power, we're looking at controlling the runner, right? So that typical lateral heel clip tackle is what we're looking at. So here's a quick game example. You got your DN coming down line of scrimmage. So now there's no, there's no, there's no power in this. We're just looking to control the runner. See that? That punch is now the emphasis. All right. So the way we really evaluate tackling is a two-step process, right? So we've broken it down into pre-contact and contact. With pre-contact, our goal is to have controlled movement to really maximize body on body contact, preferably shoulder, but as much body on body contact. Now, when we get into the contact, the goal is all about maximizing power and control. And we're going to talk a lot about those two elements, power and control, because that's where our, the foundation of our system is built on those two things. If they don't do those two things, we're not going to teach you in our system, okay? So you're going to hear me say that a bunch throughout the course of this presentation. Um, this is what we really kind of build our foundation on. So I'm going to show you three clips right here. We're going to be looking at different things, right? So first with this first one, there shouldn't be any audio on this, but... So you got Earl Thomas right here. So at first glance, this is a great open field tackle, right? But the way we're looking at it is how can we take that slide edge? How can we get a little bit better in this situation? So you can see here, the way we're looking at it is we want him to reduce that yardage. Earl's going to gain about 10 yard, one yard of, well, the, the runner's getting about nine, right? We want him to reduce that space and just be confident. Now we know this is a very tough situation for any athlete to be in open field situation. A linebacker goes underneath the block, right? He's in a tough situation. We get that. We're just trying to say nine out of 10 times, if you, were to, if you were to have this situation, how could I get better? How could I make contact a little bit earlier? How can I get him to go lateral, right? And also what you see here is due to him not closing space, he ends up in a, a negative lateral tackle, head to cross, right? Giving up those yards after contact, okay? Now, very similar situation. Now watch what happens in this clip, okay? So same thing, comes down makes contact, right? So here he actually does a, a pretty good job of closing space, but watch what happens at the point of contact. So see those preventable yards, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but watch him reduce those preventable yards. You guys see how he makes contact? He gives up those yards after contact. You'll see that his hips are behind his knees, and what we call that is late strike timing, okay? So his footwork wasn't correct there. So we're looking at, in two different clips, very similar situation, we're looking at two different things, right? He actually ends up in a positive, which is fine. We're saying, how can you maximize your, your shoulder contact and drive the runner back? Right there, we're talking about his footwork. And then lastly, in this last clip, it's going to all come together. Same situation, but watch what he does now. Not only does he close space, but he has a great, great strike timing, right? It's not a knockback tackle. It's not a, one of those, those pretty highlight tackles, but it's effective, right? See how he gets the runner to go lateral? Right? He takes away his options. He reduces that space, making for effective shoulder contact. 
At the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. Not every tackle is going to be the prettiest, but we want it to be effective and also be safe, right? And then lastly, what we do is kind of, we look at tackling very differently, right? And I think we talk a lot about being effective, um, or being, being effective versus being efficient, right? Effective is more talking about how effective are you at, were you at limiting yards after contact, but efficiency is talking about main, made or missed percentage, right? So say if you have two tacklers, both made nine out of 10 tackles, right? What did that really say? What we're saying is how can we provide and really empower these athletes by giving them in actionable insights, right? So you see player A there, we're actually giving them a full breakdown of what went wrong in those plays, right? In those games. And for a former player, I knew I always, we always have those tackles that we don't want to watch on Sunday or Saturday. Like we want to skip over them, like, okay, I'm, I'm good. I don't want to watch those plays, right? But I think it's important that we have some type of insight behind those to really get better throughout the week. That way on game days, translating, right? I always had, like, I always tell this story too, playing against Stanford, against McCaffrey. I had about, I think, nine or 10 tackles, something like that, back home in, in the Bay. I'm from the Bay Area, so I was back home in front of all my family. And they were like, oh, man, great game. We lost, like, by two touchdowns or something. But great game, man. I'm like, I don't know. I, I mean, that the stat sheet doesn't look the same as when you watch the film. I was getting dragged for four yards, and I gave up a third and one, right? So it's different, right? You really want to have that context behind your tackling, right? So here's a quick agenda. Today, we're really going to focus on how we maximize power and control, right? So kind of our two-step process. Then we're going to get some drill variation to help you maximize your drill time. And lastly, levels of contact. So tag, the tempo, kind of giving you some ways to really maximize those um, throughout the year, okay? So let's jump into it. All right, so first, what we have here, let me minimize this. So First, when it comes to pre-contact, we're looking at three key elements, okay? First being closing a space, and that's all going to happen within that evaluation zone, okay? Next is going to be the leverage. We're looking to really target the runner for effective shoulder contact, all within the decision-making zone. Lastly, having it all comes together in the action zone where we're looking at footwork to really maximize force and momentum and dominate the tackle, okay? So keep one thing in mind, Coach, one, that everything here is sequential. And what I mean by that is in order to have good leverage, we have to close space first, right? In order to have good footwork, we're looking for you to close space and effectively track the near hip and take good angles into contact. And um, so we'll get into some examples of that, okay? So closing space, I think this is the most critical element in our system because one, it teaches players how to be aggressive. I think in basketball, we always use this analogy, right? Shoot or shoot, right? Steph Curry, he might come out the gate going two for 10, but it doesn't stop him from shooting. It's the same thing in tackling. You might miss that first one in the open field, but now it's about how do you regroup and say, okay, next time I'm gonna close space better. I'm gonna track near hip. And having that, being able to have that process and have that situational awareness is key, right? So we believe closing space is essential skill to really limit the runner's options, but also minimize those preventable yards. And we'll get into some examples you saw earlier, but preventable yards are what we call basically the yardage between the identified uh, tackler and the runner that he could have closed could have reduced by closing space, okay? And some keys to that is that he had, he's identifying target, he's continuously pursuing on the balls of his feet, so not being on his heels, not giving him a two-way go, not hesitating, right? But also reacting to obstacles. And what I mean by that is for our front seven guys, right, or any position, but mainly in our front seven, we're talking about now getting off a block or staying, you know, disengaging from a block in a control position where now you have um, control over your body and momentum to make effective contact, okay? So here's a quick example you guys saw before, but of closing space full speed. So we want everyone to want our defenders to be closing confidently on the balls of their feet, not hesitating, run through contact, okay? Here's a game example. OU right here. So watch how aggressive this player comes in. He sees this, this little screen developing. Watch how he just doesn't even hesitate. He just shoots through that. He splits those, those blockers and makes good contact, right? It's not the best contact. He could have been a little bit lower, but we're talking about focusing on closing space right here, and this is a great example of that. All right, so here's an example of poor closing a space. So here's your safety right here. And again, this is going to be a lot of space. We get that. That's, that's a lot of space to cover. But we're just trying to show you guys the best examples here when we're looking at these certain elements. So you'll see a second time around, this safety will come in. We want him to reduce that space between him and the runner. That's the difference of him making contact on the 40-yard line versus where he makes it at the 35. It's a game of inches. We talk a lot. It's a cliche, but that's big, right, in terms of getting off the field. And maybe at that point, he's forcing a, a field goal, a long field goal versus 
uh, t- touchdown the red zone, right? So this is big when it comes to helping the structure of your defense. We're just looking for him to keep on closing, get that go to get that guy to go lateral. We see how he's just waiting on him, and that that runner doesn't even stop. He doesn't even hesitate. He's just running, right? So big example right there. So now we're gonna see an example of uh, reaction. So I talked about you know uh, reacting to blocks. So you see here this apex player outside linebacker. Watch how he on the on the edge right here gets cut. You see that? So that would be a poor reaction. In this situation, we're looking for him to play that block where he's able to make effective contact and, and own his area of responsibility and um, make contact with the runner right there, okay? So here's a quick progression. So after all these elements, I'm gonna kind of show you quick examples of how we kind of would implement certain, uh, certain tackle drills to uh, address these issues, right? So here's our closed angle drill choice. Really focusing on closing space and leverage right here. It's one of our, our top drills right here because it gets all three elements all in one, okay? And also we have our inside-outside leverage game. So a little bit more space, a little bit more variation on the on the angles. This is a, a very popular drill in our system. Could really so many multiple angles that you that are very unpredictable for the athlete, right? So it's a great drill to kind of emphasize closing space. All right, so next is leverage. So now we're entering the decision-making zone. So you know, you know, we talk a lot about the shoulder-led tackling, but it's truly the way I see it is it's a leverage tackle. So what I mean by that is you're taking the effective angles and tracking the near hip of the runner. So you're, you're maintaining near hip leverage. He's automatically, you're going to be able to make that near shoulder contact. But also what happens is how we're taught before is that far hip. So in order to get my head across, I'm typically tracking that upfield hip of the runner. And what that leads to a lot of times is now you're more susceptible to that cutback and over pursuing, right? So we talk a lot about how to control direction over the runner, but also targeting for effective for effective shoulder contact, really maximize contact, okay? So here's a couple of examples of leverage right here. So you'll see here, watch as this quarterback steps up in the pocket, you'll see him break break down, watch this linebacker come into play. And this is funny, this is actually their uh, their long snapper right here. So backup linebacker, but I mean, it's, everyone's doing it, right? Great job closing space, great shoulder contact, everything you're looking for in a dominant tackle. All right, this is one of my favorite clips right here. So you can see this defensive end right here, reverse play, but watch how he mimics this runner's movement. Watch how, he, it's almost like he's dancing, right? He doesn't make the best contact, but that's a, that guy's 270 right there versus a, a one, 180 running a 4-3. Look, look how calm and collected he is. Watch him just watch the hips, see how he sings them, dances with them, and he makes contact. At the end of the day, we'll live with the contact because he does a good job of, of tracking right there, okay? And a lot of times, we always get coaches that say, hey, why, why do I got my, my free tech doing drills like this? It's true. You're not always going to be doing a bunch of out in space leverage or closing space drills, but this is a difference. When you do run those and be able to have that skill throughout the week, where now it translates to game day, is where a good defense turns to elite defense, right? So everything is all about situational awareness. All right. So now you can see an example of ineffective uh, leverage right here, right? So. What we're looking for is for this defender to kind of alter his path to make effective shoulder contact. You'll see as the runner breaks through, we're looking for him to react to those visual cues and know what he has to do to alter his path, right? So now we're actually tracking that from a, a positive situation. We're now turned negative due to him not taking effective angles into contact. So see here, it's kind of similar to that closed angle draw I just showed, right? He comes through the shoot, but now we got to break that angle off a little bit more direct to make contact. You see that slight J curve, that, that slight hesitation right there ends up in a negative situation, okay? Now here's an example of a near hip. So similar to what I talked about, you can see that the defender is almost lining up to make head across a head across tackle. So once that runner puts his foot in the ground, he ends up over pursuing leading to minimal contact. see this back angles we want him tracking that near hip so the hip that's presented to him by the runner we want him tracking for effective shoulder contact so even if he's able to put his foot in the ground right here as a runner if his feet and his eyes are right he might be able to correct himself and get his feet into a position to make effective shoulder contact but you can see that he's not looking at the right the right things the right visual cues that that's what leads him to uh to over pursuing right there okay 
So here's our 2v1 leverage drill, a kind of a, your typical mirror drill, right? You guys probably seen this online, but now we added a variation to it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but a lot of our drills are very flexible where now the coach can add a, a second component into it. So now on go, they're tracking a near hip and on the second whistle, they're actually gonna converge. And uh, you can actually throw this into your turnover circuit, get guys ripping at the ball, punching it out. Very fun and creative drill, but also great for the off season because it's a very taxing drill too. Uh, great for conditioning. Here's our tackle assessment here. Great drill because it really helps the defender. You notice the defender gets to go forward, but the offense actually has to go backwards. So now you're you're giving the defender advantage and giving him the confidence by closing space now where he has the um, ability to make effective contact, okay? All right, so next, last part on our, uh, our pre-contact is gonna be the footwork. So it's probably one of the most undercoached things that we ever encounter, right? Because it's just, just like boxing, right? Footwork is key when it comes to really maximizing that pop, that body position, having that clear transfer of weight to, to momentum. So everything we talked about is having a good base, so a shoulder width base to really react to the directional change of the runner within that action zone, but also having that near foot power step. So really rolling off the balls of your feet versus being flat footed, okay? So having an active footwork and good knee to hip ratio, okay? So we have a couple examples we'll show you guys right here. So here's our, our you know, our classic two-step strike drill, really focusing on, on contact here. But you'll see that, that knee to hip ratio I talked about. See how the defender's knees are right right over his, or his hips are right over his knees, excuse me. You see the runner and how he's just getting knocked back, right? And then obviously in the game, this is one of my favorite clips, like I said before, I'm a Bay Area guy. So uh, I definitely love this game. I'm not trying to be biased here, but watch this play right here. We've all seen it, right? And this, I think it's really that, that epitome of a game of inches, right? But the defender does a great job of having that that strike time and that great footwork, right? Watch his, watch his hips at the point of contact. He was able to snap through the, the runner his foot is on, the, he's rolling out the balls of his feet, not flat footed, right? That's, that's, that's the game right there. That's, that's our season in terms of them going on the road and being a fifth seed versus being a first seed and having a, um, a first round bye, right? So really talk about game of inches, okay? Also another clip, I love this one, right? So watch this linebacker come through. And a lot of times we get we get the question of how do you guys teach a profile tackle? What is the near the near foot, near shoulder? Well, this is a perfect example of that. Basically, when you come into that profile situation, all we're looking for the defender is to have that good base. And we're now, he's basically picking a, sh a shoulder and a the foot to roll off. So we want same foot, same shoulder in that profile situation, okay? All right, so a lot of things we talk about, like I said before, is strike timing. So one thing to look for is that early strike time. So lunging or diving at the, the runner, right? What we say, this usually leads to less control, but also more missed tackles and also exposes players to injury. So we're going to show you a couple examples of this. So here's going to be an example of early strike timing in a game. So you see the defender come in here, makes contact in the backfield, but watch how he he lunges, right? So we're looking for him to just take one more step, one or two more steps, come to balance, come to control, and not lunge. We see how he dives forward. Now his hips are out past his knees, and he loses control right there, giving him more yards after contact. Okay, on the other side, you guys see this a lot too. Now we're talking about late strike time. So now your hips are behind your knees. And what that does is now you lose power into contact, right? So that flat footed, you know, your butt's behind your knees, okay? So very similar situation, same game actually. This is third and one. So watch what happens here. Motion's in, same player's gonna get put in the box, right? There's a good job of closing, but that's the difference between getting out the field right there. It's third and one. He makes, he makes contact in the backfield. I know this is a great running back, right? But we're just saying, how could he have maximized his opportunity here, right? I'm sure the player wants to know what he, what could he have done better in this situation. And watch his back angle, right? You see the hips right here we're talking about. The runner actually does a great job of getting low. He used the same foot, same shoulder, but the defender, you guys see how his butt is behind his knees? Now that compromises his leg drive too. So that was two examples of early strike timing and late strike timing right there, okay? So you guys seen this, skip through that, okay? So now we're moving on to contact. So we basically summed up our pre-contact phase. Now we're entering step two, which is our contact phase, all right? So three things that we're really looking at when, once contact is made is looking at having good body position to really maximize power, right? Next is gonna have the strike to maximize both power and control and having it all come together with a great finish to, man, to maintain those two things. And unlike, excuse me, 
Unlike the um, pre-contact, everything here is not sequential, but we're looking at simultaneous contact, right? So just like you're striking a bag or hitting the sleds, right? You want everyone hitting that bag at the same time. It's the same contact, same concept when it comes to uh, making effective contact, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so body position. So really what we're looking at here is basically having effective pad level hitting within the strike zone. So bottom of the pads to above the knees, okay? And a lot of keys that we look for is having a neutral neck. So a lot of times, we actually got this from a lot of um, Olympic power lifters is, you know, back in the day, we used to, you know, I remember we were taught to get your eyes up in the squat rack, right? But when it comes to tackling, that's not very applicable because you're never going to be in that position on the field. And if you are, then it's going to be a bad outcome, right? So we're, like, we're talking about having a neutral neck, striking on the rise, but also having your eyes over your sunglasses, what we call, so now you're striking on the rise, okay? So here's an example to see here. So the player, very neutral neck. You see how his eyes are up. He's seeing what he's hitting, right? Now here's a game example. Comes in, gets that ball loose, but just watch how he makes contact. Neutral neck, everything is just, everything is neutralized, right? He's in a safe position, effective. Everyone's good, right? This back end was probably the best. Left shoulder contact, neutral neck, good punch and everything. So here's an example of poor pad level. So we actually track in our system, we're doing, we're going through film and analyzing practice and game film. We're actually looking at what's making contact. So was it head contact? Was it chest contact? And a lot of times we see a big correlation obviously with uh, helmet to helmet contact and pad level, right? So you can see in this example, the defender is fully extended at the point of contact, giving up those unnecessary yards after contact. And yeah, three yards might not seem like a lot, right? But we talk about, talk about again, saying a game of inches, those, those yards start to stack up, right? And that's the difference between you getting off the field or, or extending a drive for the offense, right? So we really talk about having that, 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 uh, that, that pad level, okay? All right, now here's gonna be an example of a spinal line. So these are a little bit more rare in our analysis, but when, when they happen, it's definitely visible on the field. So we talk a lot about that rotational force. So the manipulation of the neck when it comes to making contact, a big factor in that is primary head contact. So you'll see from this back angle, there's not much the defender could have done in terms of how low he got, but the, the offensive guy gets low, right? We're saying to have situational awareness and know what to hit with. So in this point, we're looking for him to make shoulder contact. You'll see he goes in with his head, creating that primary head contact and having that rotational force where now his head's jerking. And this is big when it comes to keeping this, your players on the field, right? You want to have your best players on the field. You don't want to lose players to injuries, but also you don't want to lose them to the rest making a call on a targeting, right? Like a helmet to helmet in that previous clip. You don't want to put that in the hands of the rest because they already have a, a difficult enough job, right? So especially in high school when they don't have a uh, the replay booth is critical to have good awareness about where you're making contact. All right, coaches? All right, so here's a quick drill that we would do is our 1v1 goal line choice. A great competitive drill. Love doing this one. Um, really focuses on contact. Obviously, we're doing this without pads here, but this is one of those drills you might want to run like first week of camp or something where you get your shells on to really up increase that, that competitive nature, all right? Have, have a winner or a loser in this drill, and it's great for, it's great for that, okay? Players are gonna love it. All right, so now moving on to the strike. We've got about 30 minutes. All right, so strike. So this is the biggest part when it comes to contact, right? So all about maximizing power and control, talking about simultaneous shoulder contact, okay? So keys to look for is that the defender is making primary shoulder contact. So we're talking about like the top of your shoulder. Now that's gonna be tough. Every time you're not gonna be able to make top, you know, primary shoulder contact, but you'll, you'll notice a lot of times when players are making contact and their shoulders open up, it's most likely because they're making more of that, that bicep to elbow contact where now the runner's going through them and their shoulders are, are opening up. So we want them to, them to stay square throughout contact by making primary shoulder contact. And then also, we talk a lot about the punch, right? And this is one of those little nuances that are kind of overlooked because same thing as a box, like I said, I always talk about boxers, but everything they do is tight to the body. So as I was in Pop Warner, we always talk about get big, right? Or, or that, that swooping motion. But we always ask coaches, is, what is that doing? When you're coming through and swooping up, what is that doing? Is, is it creating power and control? And a lot of times they can't answer it. A lot of times you get players that want to go through with that and it, it creates that chest to profile situation where now they're actually raising their body profile versus coming through and jabbing through. It automatically makes forces the player to, to lower their body profile, okay? 
And also when you get wide, now you're, you're leaving that shoulder up for injury, right? Because you got that, if you guys just feel on your shoulder right now, if you open it up like that, it's how your bone, your joints all, uh, all exposed. But now you, if you put your shoulder out in front of you, you can feel how that shoulder cap is protected. And now when you're jabbing through all that butt, that body and that muscle is flexed up, but now you're just, just going through the contact, okay? So here's kind of an example of what we're looking for. Same foot, same shoulder, prim primary shoulder cones, okay? Good punch, good knee to hip ratio, hip extension, all that stuff, all right? Here's another example, really focusing on the punch here. So you can see in this example, I think this guy outweighs um, the guy by about 70 pounds, right? So actually coming through here, he's making primary shoulder contact. You can see we're not weighing pads. You watch how his head snapping back, right? Very, it's a very physical, very physical um, hit, right? So that that punches out, making primary shoulder contact is really important. Here's another example of that neutral neck. So seeing what you're hitting, right there, okay? Here's a game example from OU. Great open field tackle, great punch, good closing of space there. I can really focus on the strike right here. Great job of closing, gets in position, making primary shoulder contact, good punch, and drops the runner right there, okay? Now this next clip is gonna kind of have all three elements. So uh, spinal line, near shoulder, and actually a punch, right? So here's one of those common tackles where obviously if he doesn't make this tackle, it's gonna be a touchdown, right? We get that. We're just saying this is a hell of a running back. So if he stays up, what could he have done better? So you'll see in this back angle of what we could have corrected. So you got that spinal line, see how it's kind of dipping in. You can't really see it from this angle, but also you notice that his arm is tucked. So now his punch is neutralized. And I want to show this back angle. Let's see if I can fast forward it. So you'll see here as he comes into contact, I'm going to try to pause it. So he should be making left shoulder contact here, because right, left shoulder. But now you'll see when he makes contact, this is one of the, those clips I like to show when it comes to head across or head behind debate, right? Because we know that the head's going to be across sometimes. We can't always control that. But the issue with that is, see how this player right here, he goes head across. Now his head's taking on that, that primary contact of, and force of the runner. So now when the runner goes through his head, there's nothing there to stop him versus if he's making left shoulder contact. Now he has his shoulder contact, the biggest part of his body, along with his control arm to punch through and his right arm to come through and hook it, right? Versus here he gets, I'm not going to say he gets lucky, but... If, he, if that runner stays up, we're looking at, okay, what could he have done better, right? So that punch and having that near shoulder contact is huge when it comes to limiting yards of the contact and really maximizing control, okay? All right, so here's another example I like to put in here. Here's our stiff arm game. So it talks a lot about, one, having situational awareness, right, but also having to defeat, defeat the stiff arm. It doesn't happen often, but being able to have the, that skill and that to, in your toolbox and be able to maximize contact is big. So here's a quick example of our stiff arm game from a negative situation, right? Because typically we're not going to do a stiff arm from a positive situation. So we actually have the offense start in a negative situation. And here's a game clip. So watch, I love this clip because watch how the defender does a great job of fighting off that stiff arm. So he uses his off arm and getting into that left shoulder using his near shoulder to drop the runner. He doesn't roll, right? That emphasis is not on rolling. Emphasis is on making shoulder contact there. So we love to show that clip right there, okay? All right, so here's our strike time injury. So similar to our two-step strike, now we're kind of expanding for about 67 yards. So now there's a little element of closing space, but also you can get multiple reps with multiple players in there, okay? All right, then last time we kind of skip through this because it's a finish, right? So the finish is all, all stuff that we talk about, drive for five, you know, wrap and squeeze, right? And it's really maintaining power and control, right? So as I mentioned before in the, in the, um, in the body position of strike, we're creating power and control. With the finish, we're just looking to have it all come together and really maintain those two things through effectively wrapping and squeezing and have a continuous leg drive, all right? So I'm gonna skip through these last plays, but I'm gonna show you our sumo cone choice game. So this is a great drill to emphasize not only pad level and punch, but also a great finish because you'll see here, the objective is, and they could be a little more competitive, but you can imagine that this is a, kind of that bull in the ring type of drill. Well, now the emphasis is on, that's a good rep right there. The offense makes them work a little bit. This really helps the defender get his feet right, but also focus on that, that maintaining of power and control, okay? All right, so now we're going to get to concept two, so really drill development, okay? 
So out of this, we actually break down our drills into three different categories. So first being technical, which is really focused on movement and execution, right? So striking the bag, very simple drills that we do and we do them right and we do them a lot, right? Our expectation in these drills is to have about 90 to 100% success, okay? And while teaching these, while coaching these, we're using very direct questioning, like you know, using your near foot or use your right shoulder, right? So everything is very player um, driven, okay? Now when it comes to decision-making drill, now we're adding a, one or two options for now we're problem solving, right? So now the expectation drops a little bit and also you're scaling back your questions, even more open-ended questions. How was your pad level there? How, how'd you close space, right? So you're kind of giving them pieces of the puzzle. And uh, lastly, we're gonna have game-based drills with all the, the great drills that we love to run, the very competitive, get you ready for game day, right? And obviously the, 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 the expectation is gonna drop to about 60 to 70%. And for a coach, having that, that flexibility and being able to have that, that awareness to say, hey, you, if you notice that your guys are struggling, they're dipping below that 60%, then maybe you need to scale back and get back to the, the technical drills, right? Or if it's getting too easy where they're jumping above that 70%, then maybe you have to expand the drill, or add some more variation to it to make it more challenging, okay? And uh, one thing I do want to mention here is that when it comes to drill variation, it's really important to have balance when it comes to this. Uh, as a former player, I think at UW we had about, I want to say 90% of our drills, about 75% of our drills were in the technical phase, and the rest of them were in the game base. We had no decision-making drills um, my fresh, my uh, my junior year. Senior year, we actually expanded our library to like, you know, 30 drills. Obviously, you're not going to use those every day. This is having the option to have that variation and have that systematic post tackling, okay? All right, so I said before, technical drills are very coach-directed, right? We're saying very direct instruction, okay? Here's a couple examples. Here's our two-step strike drill. So a drill like this, when it comes to a technical, the coach, we actually want him standing behind the um, behind the offense or to the side of the defense. That way you can really see their um, eyes and the shoulder contact being made, okay? And a drill like this, you might you might have, you know, three to four pairs going at once, maybe six, and just have them go. You know, you're saying, hey, I'm go, we're going to our right, right? So we're making right shoulder contact, and they know, right? Left, they're gonna know you might do three reps of each, and then we're gonna we're gonna switch. Okay, so that's a technical drill. They know what the outcome is gonna be. All right. So here's that example of the coaching. So a lot of our things online too is we actually give feedback to the coaches too. So when we go through and we look at all your drills, we're not only we're not only focused on the players, we're focusing on the setup and the coach's role too. Okay, so that's really big when it comes to placement, stuff that kind of gets overlooked, but that can really benefit you and your vision in terms of what you can um, see. In, uh, in the drill, okay? All right, so now decision-making drills. So now we have that one or two options, right? So here's an example of that 2v1 leverage game, okay? Great drill because it really taxes defense. The defenders actually have to can go outside those cones, so the offense has to stay within those. So those are really taxing. You might go for about eight to 10 seconds or till failure. You just blow the whistle, next guy up, right? So you can have about two two different stations just going at once, make it very competitive, winners and losers, and it's a great drill to kind of focus on that eye discipline, but also tracking tracking the near hip, okay? All right, the last thing is those game-based drills. So all the drills that we love to do, um, it's all about having balance too, right? You just want to just throw your players into a game-based drill from day one, right? You might do it in terms of gauging their, we actually might recommend that, but it's not something you want to do every day is just focus on game-based drill. You have to have that variation, right? You have to give them the tools to be successful in those situations, okay? So here's our 1v1 cone game, one of our more, one of our more popular drills because there's so many different options, it's about 16 different variations in this drill. We're really focusing on closing space here, leverage, and even footwork. Even though it's a tag, a tag tempo, we're still looking for effective strike timing, rolling off the toes, okay? Now, again, same drill, but now we added a blocker and a secondary defender. So this is great in terms of you're being, being able to be flexible and add that variation. So without set, without changing the setup in the cones, we've we kept the same drill and just changed the focus, right? So now we have a, a, a element of block destruction, but also a 2v2 situation. You'll see there the, the secondary defender kind of gets caught peeking, and now he leaves the, the fit player kind of out to dry. So this is a great drill, very fun, and really good for your system type defense, okay? All right, lastly, we're gonna get into our types of contact, okay? so. Obviously, right now, hopefully we have a football season. I'm very optimistic in that, but I think this is big when it comes to maximizing your practice time and your tackling time because 
you have to have that variation of types of tempo. That way you're, you're not breaking any regulation, any rules. You're, uh, you're also able to work on tackling year in and year out. Okay. So first we have our palms down tag off. Next is going to be our dino strike thud and live. Okay. So there's a couple of examples of those too. So the reason why we call it palms down, we get this question a lot is because it's very descriptive. So you'll see as the defender comes in here, by getting my palms down, we're actually forcing the player to lower their body profile and tag off versus having your palms up or having that swoop motion. Same, we always talk about that that tag off. Oh, I got them, coach. But it's like, did you really have them, right? Because what that does is that raises your body profile when players doing that. So by having them tag off and having that belt, those bent elbows, you're simulating that that thud tempo. So now when you transition to thud, it's a simple punch, right? Versus coming lower and having to re-lower re your body profile, okay? So here's an example of palms down strike in a, in a drill, okay? Comes to balance, tags off. Cool. So dino strike. So this is one of those things that we actually probably recommend day one, day two of pass to really get your players acclimated with making shoulder contact. So you're not going to do this tempo very often. It's fairly new to most coaches, but essentially you'll see here, coaches, it's a, it's a tag off tempo, but now you're adding that shoulder contact and you're just bracing yourself as a defender. So it's still a very physical hit, um, but you want to use this in like very low impact drills. Um, and uh, yeah, so you want only in positive situations too. So you don't want to use this in a negative situation, okay? Okay, so then next is gonna be that thud tempo. So similar to dino strike, but now all stuff you guys do, now we're just throwing a punch, right? So we're not going to the ground, but we're throwing a punch in there. And keep in mind too, we wanna to use these only in positive situations. So anytime in practice it gets to a negative situation, just have it be a tag tempo, okay? So here's that thud tempo. And we actually have coaches that will go in on seven on seven, right? And they'll say, okay, players, before a drill starts, they might blow a whistle and make it very clear that, hey, if you guys end up in that positive situation, you guys are allowed to thud, thud up, right? But anytime it gets to that negative situation, we gotta make it a palms down strike. So that does two things. One, it creates situational awareness for your players, but also it keeps it competitive because now you got players that are, are doing different things in their track to make effective shoulder contact because they wanna actually be able to, you know, hit the guy over the middle or do something, be physical, right? So it's a great, great way to kind of develop that situational awareness, okay? And then lastly is live, right? So pretty self-explanatory. Um, so you can see our two-step strike drill here, but now we're gonna add a crash pad. And when you guys use your crash pads, always remember to um, have it be about two to three yards away from the finish cone, because that really helps emphasize that leg drive, but also you don't got guys getting hurt by going over the top of the bag, right? So it really helps them focus on that, that leg drive and punch and make them maintain that contact, all right? Here's another angle of it. All right, so about, got about 15 more minutes. So now I'm gonna kind of go through how we kind of help teams our different reporting and also some of the stuff that you can find online, okay? So one thing that we do is we have this um, type of reporting called the core, right? And there's two different variations. Some coaches like the straight to the point, very summarized thing. So we actually developed this to really help kind of identify the key issues from that game. So every Friday, Saturday, we have a team of analysts that you're turning your film in on huddle, right? You're sharing it with us. And within 24 to 48 hours, we're actually giving you a report back with detailed insights, um, you know, coaching points, and also a, a tailored tackle plan. So that's that's huge when it comes to not only week-to-week -week, um, improvement, but also just helping your staff and your players maximize their practice time, okay? And now we actually have another one where it's a little bit more expanded, so a little bit more in-depth, right? But now you can see a running total from week to week. And it's really good, it has all our top top things like performance rating, made miss percentage, and who, you know, key insights. You see at the top three insights that kind of, this might be a, either a positive or negative takeaway from the game to help you guys get better. But also you're having a running total of everything from points allowed, uh, made miss percentage, performance rating, all that stuff, okay? So it's a great tool to have. Also, we have individual tackle assessments. So now uh, we have play, we have teams that will put this up in their um, in their locker room after the, after after a game, right? So now you got players looking at it, and they're engaged, and they're able to see where they uh, where they dropped off or where they improved, right? So it's a really good drill to not only be not a really good tool to be transparent, but also kind of create that sense of competitiveness and also self drive a little bit, right? So. And lastly, I think is one of the most important things is the cut up 
the cut up portion. So we'll actually go in after a game and give you about 10 to 15 different what we call coachable moments. And we'll actually go in and we'll label, we'll share a cut up list with you. We're now, we're going to have about 10 to 15 plays labeled with type of tackle was, who was it, what was the issue on that play, and also a little a little comment. So that way now you can build up build a library of yourself from you know 10 to 100 tackles over the course of a season where you just have a, a library saved up of Atavis cut-ups where you guys can use that for um, future classes and all that stuff. So it's a great tool to have, okay? And then lastly, the tackle plan, as I mentioned. So this is really a, a cool tool because one, you're gonna have a program champion that that's straight from out of this. And you're going to say, hey, so for example, hey, Scott, I got, you know, 10 minutes on Tuesday, 10 minutes on Wednesday, and five on Thursday. I need a tackle plan that's going to fit that, right? So based on the issues that we identify in, in, in the season um, or of that game, we're going to give you a tailored tackle plan to fix those issues and address those issues within the time frames that you guys have, right, in the structure. And we'll do this during the off season where it's more based on like a program assessment where now we're giving you a whole, you know, two week plan of a progression that helps you really maximize your players and get them up to speed. And I think right now is a critical time to do that. If anything we can be working on, we can be working on tackling right now. I think it's something that we can do that's gonna help your program once we hit the ground running, hopefully in the next, next month or so. I'll skip over that. This is kind of a, basically our year round uh, program, some of the stuff that we offer, but we can definitely provide this with you. Just reach out to myself or Sean Hopper our information is right here. Um, thank you guys for uh, joining. It was a great pleasure talking to you coaches. And like I said before, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, reach out to our numbers, our emails, and we'll love to connect with you and answer any questions you may have. Uh, with social yeah. di distancing and limited ability to perform drills involving player to player contact, do you have any drills that can be done to help guys working, tackling under the current circumstances? Like what would you suggest? Um, <clears throat> like I said, my mind goes straight to bags and like that, but I mean, in your opinion, what, what do you, how would you guys? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we obviously got that in the last couple months, a lot of times. And for us, the biggest thing is safety, right? When it comes to, it's hard to say, you know, to be able to go through these workouts and say, okay, we're going to do this effectively and do it safe. Right. But there are things like you recommended, if you have access to a sled, um, and you have it in your backyard or you have a local place that you can go by yourself and do it. I think stuff like strike timing, maybe not specific drills per se, but the elements are important. So elements of closing space, elements of tracking the near hip, elements of strike timing are things that easily translate in these type of settings where now once you get into a drill, you can um it can it can help you improve. Awesome coach. Um what's Thanks, something man. that can help taking an extra step while tackling? That's how that's worded. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think I understand. So a lot of times what we have is Let's say when it comes to strike timing, like I said before, every player is going to be different. So I'm not going to ask my my six seven D lineman is not going to be the same as my 180 pound uh, defensive back, right? Everyone takes time to get it. So that's why one, it's really big to to hit to have that player on player feedback. So what I mean by that is, yeah, striking the bag is good, but we actually have a rating system. I didn't talk much about it, but we actually emphasize a lot of times that when you're hitting someone, they're actually giving you a, a rating of one to 10. That way you're getting that instant feedback. And you're knowing, okay, now, okay, he gave me, he gave me a five, right? So maybe my hips weren't centered properly. Maybe I was, I was too far, far extended. Maybe I was too back on my heels. So I wasn't able to roll into him, right? So now just having that, that instant feedback helps players be able to um, adjust on the fly. And also your, um, and also some stuff we see is uh, even in like, we got in conditioning drills, just having a coach at the end of, of the conditioning, throwing a towel left or right and having a player uh, have a power step at the, right there, right? That's a simple way that we, we've we seen coaches implement it to focus on strike timing. So there's a couple things that could definitely help. I don't know if you yeah. know the direct answer to this coach, but how, how did you see an MSU benefit from your system um, since they've taken mm -hmm. over and started doing that? Yeah, great question. So I think in the numbers, they speak for themselves. So I showed you earlier. Um, but I'll kind of go step by step. So MSU is a very unique story, I think, because that was one of the first, like, they were the first um, to really fully adopt it and say, hey, we're, we're going to do something because Coach D'Antonio was big on it. Uh, it was funny when we went there and presented the first time, he's like, it was interesting because, like, hey, one thing that's not, if you can't tackle, you're not going to be playing on Sunday. So right here, what these guys are going to be showing you, you better pay attention to. And for me, I was like, that's because tackling and blocking is an essential skill, but it's kind of like, overlooked and he said that this is going to be an emphasis for us so D'Antonio and his staff did a great job of fully embracing it and we actually came in there 
about two or three times a year to really make sure they're doing it correctly. And also just that overall engagement from their staff was huge, right? I think their def- in, in our conference, it's all about physical, being physical. And that's one thing they do really well is being physical at the point of contact. They play a lot of a lot of heavy run teams, those Wisconsin's and all those guys that want to get physical. So that's one of their strong suits. And I think just them overall just adopting it from, from day one has been big for them in the last three years. Um, and then Cincinnati, Coach Freeman and Fickle, obviously Fickle is at um, Ohio State. And uh, they just, they have the athletes, they have great athletes out there, but also they just play so aggressive and they do really, they're really good at this closing space and and, clo- and uh, kind of just being aggressive, right? I think that's their, their nature too. They really adopted and Coach Freeman actually came into Seattle for a day and just basically took a holistic approach and really just got fully ingrained in it. And he went back to Cincinnati and the, the, connect, the connection was great. So that was two big, one of our, our two better programs in terms of really having those jumps and definitely a pleasure working with them.